There's one other name you might know me by. Joker Fett. Who? Joker Fett, man. You know, legendary YouTuber? Guys? I forget it. I'm hooked on a feeling I'm high on believing That you're in love with me Hey everybody, Jokerfit here once more back again with another video and surprise surprise I'm talking about Marvel again and um, this time I'm bringing you guys my top 10 Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Now I thought this would be a good time to go ahead and do a top 10 list for Marvel since A, first off, we finally have 10 Marvel Cinematic Universe movies so I can do a top 10 and not an awkward top 9 or top 8. Um, and also because this is um, after the Guardians of the Galaxy, which opened up just a uh, a couple weeks ago now, maybe three, three or two, I don't remember. Uh, a few weeks ago now, Guardians of the Galaxy opened up, and that's our final uh, MCU film before uh, the Avengers 2, which will wrap up Phase 2 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And after that, it's just pretty much going to be a... Uh, a straight shot towards Avengers 3 with the Infinity Gauntlet, and we're going to get, in the meantime, Doctor Strange and a couple sequels to other Marvel franchises. And so I just thought now it would be a good time to do the list before things get too crazy and I start to have to omit movies from my list and just um, change it up that way. So maybe at a later date... Um, a year or two down the line, I'll do another video with my uh, revised top 10 uh, Marvel movies. But now, we have an even 10 Marvel movies. Guardians of the Galaxy, Guardians of the Galaxy just came out. And um, so yeah, now would be a good time to do it. So. And before we get started, I just wanted to say that um, this is a top 10 Marvel Cinematic Universe films list only. So that means, you know, no X-Men, no Spider-Man, no Fantastic Four, no Daredevil, even if I don't think he would make the top ten anyway, but, um, so yeah, no of the, no other non-Marvel Studios slash Disney, uh, Marvel films. I, I feel like that's kind of weird, like, w when I say Marvel films, I mean Marvel Studios films. And so, yeah, none of those licensed out other studio films, which um, which may be their own list at some other time. But, yeah, so this is only movies made by Marvel Studios and published by Paramount slash Disney, depending on whenever they came out. So that's your little heads up in case anybody, you know, is commenting. If you're typing your comment right now, like, Oh, I sir, I hope the X Men's gonna be number one. But yeah, so that that may be its own list at another date. But this is purely the MCU right now. So on to the list. Father. Hey! So beginning with number ten on my list, which um, by the way, this list will go from least favorite number ten to most favorite number one. Um, so it's, it's really, it's no surprise that number 10 on my list is Iron Man 3. Um, at the time the movie came out, you guys heard a whole lot about it from me, uh, through both YouTube and Facebook, social media. I've done two very long videos on all my reasons to hate Iron Man 3, which are still up. You can go watch them if you wish, but just... Un, to sum it up briefly, I'm not going to spend much time on this movie, just unfaithfulness to the characters, not only the co characters in the original comic source material, but also unfaithfulness to the characterizations of the characters that were, that were in the previous Iron Man films and in the Avengers. Um, for instance, Tony Stark, he, he doesn't feel like the lovable, smartass... Uh, genius that he was in the previous films. He just seems mean and unpleasant to be around. And um, also the whole post-traumatic stress disorder 
uh, plot line, which I I appreciate that they tried to tackle such a delicate topic, especially in modern day America and the world. But just from a logic standpoint, it doesn't really make any sense whatsoever that now he gets post P or PTSD um, when he didn't after being captured and held hostage by terrorists for an undisclosed amount of time, like months. But he gets PTSD by flying a missile into space. I don't know. It's it just the movie. It's just bad. It's just a bad movie. Uh, and like I said, there are two very long videos on my channel, which you can look up. Just type Iron Man 3 into the search bar, and you can, hear, if you want to, you can hear my very extensive thoughts on both A, why I thought it was bad, and B, how I thought it could have been better. So that's, that's that for Iron Man 3. On to number 9. Number nine on my list is uh, Thor, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I had a hard time choosing between Thor and Thor 2 because I think that they are very equal on a on in terms of quality. And that's not to say that they're bad movies. They're just very okay movies, in my opinion. Um, I think that both of them, especially Thor 2, which I'll talk about later, but both of them are um, very much like the kind of just the formula, the basic formula for how to make a Marvel movie. They have some MacGuffin that, um, that the main character needs to, or Thor, and they need to keep away from the bad guys. And both have generally unremarkable villains, which I know is crazy because, you know, uh, Loki. But I think really in the first Thor film, Loki was not, he did, he, well, he hadn't yet come into his own as a character. I think that happened in the Avengers, which we'll, spoiler, spoiler, we'll talk about later in the list. Um, so, yeah, I think Thor is generally... It's an unremarkable superhero film. I think it's just... It's very okay superhero film. And it's enough to entertain you for the time being. But, you know, other than that, it just feels like a very small superhero film. It's, a, it's I like to describe it as a low-budget, big-budget superhero film. Because there's only two primary locations in the film. Three if you're counting Jotunheim, which is only in the movie for like ten minutes... And so it just it doesn't feel like the big galaxy spanning adventure that Thor should have. So anyway, so on to Thor 2 to talk about it. Father. Hey! So like I said, Thor 2 is just it's your blueprint for a Marvel movie, honestly. And I think that it's saving grace that keeps it from being 10 or 9 is that it does have, it has more exciting action and adventure that I'd hoped for in the first Thor film, and it also has um, more Tom Hiddleston Loki, which, like I said, in the first Thor film, I think Loki was pretty forgettable, but he came into his own in Avengers, and so in Thor 2, um, he has a, um, for the duration of the film that he's in it, uh, he, I think he has some good banter with Thor, and um, altogether I think he's a good character. But besides that, everybody's pretty generic in this film. Malekith, the villain, played by Christopher Eccleston, who you'd think would be more memorable because you know he's a he's a famous Scottish a, f a famous Scottish actor, and you know he was the Doctor in Doctor Who. But he's, his character is just completely bland and forgettable. His motivations are basic at best. I mean, what does he want? He wants to make the universe dark. Okay, why is that? I mean, it doesn't seem like he has any particular trouble living in the light. So I don't know why. Is he just uncomfortable in the light and that's why he wants to turn it off? I'm, I don't know. And also, um, I, I didn't talk about her in, in the when I was talking about Thor 1, but Natalie Portman, Jane Foster in, in these films is really a pathetic character, a pathetic female character, especially considering 
the other um, female characters that we've seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, seriously, in Thor 2, it's pretty much like she spent the past two years since Thor 1 sitting around moping, going, oh, poor pitiful me, because Thor hadn't visit her, visited her, and she's... She's supposed to be like this acclaimed astrophysicist, but she just sits around and mopes because a guy hasn't called her. It, it's really, it's, it's quite pathetic. That's, that's honestly the best way I can describe it. And, you know, it's like she, <laughs> she hasn't heard of the saying, you know, there's other fish in the sea, pretty much. So, you know, her character is just pathetic in these films, and... I really hope she's not in Thor 3, even though she probably will be. So anyway, Thor 2 is just a very mediocre Marvel movie, and it's just the blueprint for how to make a generic Marvel film. You got, like I said with Thor 1, you got this MacGuffin, the Aether, and this forgettable villain who wants the MacGuffin to do something evil with it. And it's 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 been done better in other Marvel films, which we will talk about. So on to number 7. So number seven on my list is Iron Man 2. And I think it's 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 up there with Thor. I think it's it's better than Thor because, you know, just because of the actors and the performances that they give, but it's pretty much it's a very similar kind of movie to Thor where it's just it's your decent okay Marvel film. And I think that's large part due to the fact that it was rushed into production because um, honestly, Marvel Studios was not expecting Iron Man to be as big of a hit as it was, so they were in a big rush to pump out another Marvel film, um, because they knew that, um, originally they were only just gonna have one Iron Man film, some, the same way that they did with the other Marvel franchises, and just have one Thor, one Captain America, before leading up into the Avengers, but they just rushed it out there, um, and really, it's just it's kind of, it's just like more of the same, and except for that the same isn't quite as good the second time around because you expect it to be more than what it was the first time. So I just I just think it's a very okay film. I think Robert Downey Jr. he's still great as Iron Man in the film, as Tony Stark. He's witty. He's funny. Uh, we finally get War Machine in um, the film, though played by a different actor, Don Cheadle, uh, this time around. So, um, yeah, it's it's a decent movie. I think that um, uh, Justin Hammer, the villain, who I think is really the kind of like the primary antagonist. Um, some would say Mickey Rourke as Ivan Vanko is the primary antagonist, but he's just kind of like the brutish. He's he's just the brute. He's the muscle. But um, Justin Hammer, played by uh, I forget the actor's name at the moment off the top of my head, but I think he does actually a really good job. And he's a funny kind of, uh, I guess like um, almost like the evil clone of Tony Stark, really. Because I mean, he's very much similar to Tony Stark in terms of character. They're both like these kind of wise ass. Uh, genius millionaire billionaires they're the head of their own respective technology companies except for Justin Hammer's just you know he's not quite as good as Tony Stark so you know he's kind of like he's kind of the envious second place kind of character so I think he's good and overall it's a decent movie but it's just it's disappointing because it is more the same and it doesn't really add anything to the mix. So it, it's definitely just a filler movie to waste time before getting to the Avengers and the other uh, hero introduction films. So anyway, with that in mind, let's go on to number six. Father. Hey! So number six on my list is The Incredible Hulk, which I think is actually a pretty underrated Marvel film, and actually an oftentimes forgotten Marvel film, because a lot of people that I've talked to have, you know, forget that this is actually even in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I think that that's due in large part to a couple of things. First off, it's because, well, A... It's it was a one-off film. It wasn't turned into a franchise. Um, I from what I know, it was disappointing at the box office to Marvel. 
So that so they decide to not go ahead with an Incredible Hulk 2, and instead we got Iron Man 2. Um, so it just it didn't do well at the office, so box office, so it didn't get a franchise. And also because it has a different Bruce Banner, and it seems like that's kind of like a, a kind of a plague with uh, Hulk movies is that they can never hold on to a Bruce Banner. Because we had Eric Bana in the Ang Lee Hulk film in the early 2000s, which is not a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And then we had Ed Norton in this film, who I thought did a uh, pretty good job as the kind of scientific side of Bruce Banner. And then ultimately, he had some kind of contract dispute with Marvel. And uh, Mark Ruffalo got the job as Bruce Banner in The Avengers so I think it's an underrated film. It's a good introduction to the Hulk, and it definitely pays homage to um, the original Bill Bixby Incredible Hulk show from the '70s, which um, I, I adore. I think it, and because of that, it, it carries on a lot of the same style as that. And you even even at one point in the film, they uh, they play the Lonely Man theme song from the uh, the show. So. I think I think it's a good film and it's an underrated Marvel film so definitely check it out if you haven't already. Father. Hey! And now on to my number 5 pick which I am sure will probably surprise quite a few people because they would expect this film to be higher up on the list. But actually I think it just speaks to the quality of the movies that will be like from this point on in the rest of the list as to why this film is at the position that it is and so my number five pick is actually Iron Man the first one the original the movie that started it all for Marvel uh, Marvel Studios and I think that at the time it really enthralled audiences I was certainly really just in love with the film when I saw it this was you know this was uh, quite a few years ago now. This is six years ago, so I was 11 at the time. And so, you know, really, throughout my teenage years, I've kind of grown up with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and this was the introduction. So this will always have a special place with me, and I don't want you guys to think that because it's number five on the list that I think less of it. it I just think that these other films, again, are... Um, personally, I think they're better because Marvel... Marvel they kind of constantly improved upon themselves and just you know we've, we've gotten better movies since then but um, I think it's a great origin story for Iron Man a great movie to kick off the Marvel Cinematic Universe obviously it really turned around the career of Robert Downey Jr. who at the time was you know kind of uh, he had gone through you know rehab and stuff and so you know people had kind of written him off but Iron Man comes along, it re revitalizes his career, and it makes, you know, which will pretty much be um, his, you know, his signature role. I think, you know, people looking back in the future, you know, 20 years from now, uh, when they look at Robert Downey Jr.'s career, they're going to, you know, they're going to point out and say, you know, Iron Man, that Tony Stark, that was his defining role, that he just, he really owned it, and it's something that he's going to be remembered for. And so I think for that reason, it really has gotten the acclaim that it has. Um, besides that, I think that the villain, Obadiah Stane, is, he's so-so. He's played by Jeff Bridges, which is uh, a pretty good actor, but um, I don't know. I just think that, I think that that's kind of been a curse with all Iron Man films, is that they haven't had good villains. It's always been somebody who, who Tony inadvertently wronged in the past. And so, you know, I just think that that kind of holds it back, but it's still a great film. And so pretty much from this point on, like I said, all these movies are great and you should see them. And their placement is just kind of coincidental um, because, you know, I can't like put them all in the same place because that would be cheating. So anyway, that uh, Iron Man is a great film. It's what started it all. So definitely go check it out. Father. Hey! Number four on my list is another uh, origin film for an Avenger, and that is Captain America, the First Avenger, which um, I've gone on record in the past. It seems like I say, I say this in every video now, but I'm a history buff. I enjoy it, and so, you know, historical fiction, I think, 
It personally, I'm more susceptible to it. And Captain America 1 has this great visual style with this whole retro uh, 1940s look. And I think that's great that they um, decide to set the entire film in the 40s in World War II um, instead of, you know, like having like the first 30 minutes of it being like, oh, he gets his super strength and then he goes in the ice and now here he is in modern day. Um, but no, they set the entire film in World War II and just has a great uh, fictitious exaggerated, uh, idealistic 1940s kind of appeal to it. I think that the villain, Red Skull, um, I think that he just, uh, Hugo Weaving really just kind of like has fun with the character, you know, because I mean, it's either, you can play it either two ways. You can either be, be this like super, this super, you know, scary, evil Nazi, uh, which would be something you'd more expect in like Schindler's List or something and but or you can go you know kind of exaggerated just you know like I am evil ha <laughs> you know that kind of thing and I think that's what he does with the Red Skull he just has fun with it and um, I think that you know it works with the film's tone and Chris Evans I think that he does a great uh, Captain America and this will not be the last time that we talk about Chris Evans on this list but, um, and anyway, especially considering that, um, this is coming off of the Fantastic Four films, where he's pretty much the opposite of, Can of Captain America, playing, um, the Human Torch, which is this, you know, smart-ass, sarcastic, um, uh, goofy character, but, and obviously Captain America is very straight-laced and serious and patriotic and stuff. But, um, yeah, so I think it's great for what it is, you know, very just enjoyable, um, action adventure. And it, you know, it, I think it's being the film to lead up to the Avengers, I think that it does a great job. So, Captain America, the first Avenger, number four on my list. Now on to the top three. Dun, dun, dun. Father. Hey! Now, before I go on to talk about my uh, top three, I just wanted to say that this matchup was the absolute hardest for me to decide who would be number three and who would be number two. I was pretty uh, sure of number one, which we'll talk about it when we get to it. But number three and number two, um, it was just, it's incredibly difficult. And the matchup was between Guardians of the Galaxy and the Avengers. And, you know, I had to think about this for several days before I could make this video. If I hadn't, if I, if this had been easier for me to decide, this video might have been up on, like, during the weekend or something. But I really had to put some thought into this. I actually went back and watched The Avengers again just to um, think about it and decide. And I think also that is kind of at a disadvantage here, um, just, you know, deciding this matchup, because, one, The Avengers, I've seen it about a bajillion times now, it came out two years ago now, so I've seen it quite a few times, and Guardians of the Galaxy is fresh, it's the latest hot new thing, and it, it's obviously not out on video yet, so I can't just re-watch it at my own leisure, but I have gotten to see it a couple times now in theaters, and, you know, it, it's it's an incredibly difficult matchup. I think that they're, and, you know, coincidentally, they're both team movies, and I think that they both do a great job with balancing the team and sharing screen time. So, ultimately, it just came down to um, which movie I had the most emotional investment in when I saw it. And so... You know, I think, you know, there is there's some people that, you know, just love Guardians of the Galaxy and could care less about the Avengers and vice versa with, um, but for me it was incredibly difficult and the Avengers won out. I have to say the Avengers is my number two, but to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy, my number three, um, it's just, it's, it's an, it's a great movie. I think that it has a very great appeal um, I think especially if you're a fan of Star Wars or other kind of like science fiction, space opera, kind of action adventure, I think it's a great film. Um, it's a very funny film, whereas I, I think of like um, 
again, talking about the abysmal Iron Man 3, that movie was laughing at you, the viewer. It was laughing at you. It's like, ah, oh, you care about this comic book crap? But um, Guardians of the Galaxy is laughing with you. It's kind of a celebration of, you know, Marvel's achievements up to this point. And, you know, it's like the victory lap, really. It's, it's a fun romp. And the characters are all very well written. They're, you know, every character has their own moment to shine, I think. And the soundtrack was great and everything. And if you want to hear me talk about Guardians of the Galaxy, um, you can check out on my channel. Um, just recently, just the other day, I did a, uh, a late night live show with uh, JCC2224, otherwise known as Adam. And uh, Darth Phoenix 619, and we talked about it for um, several hours, just dissecting the film and talking about the characters and which ones we liked and which ones we didn't, and the soundtrack, and pretty much everything that you could possibly think of to critique about Guardians of the Galaxy, we talked about in that live show. So you can go ahead and check that out on the channel after you finish watching this video, of course. And it's, it's a great time. It's, it's a really great time. And I highly encourage um, any of you guys out there to go see it while it is still in theaters. I think it's definitely... It looks very impressive on the big screen. So it's a fun time. And it's... Um, you can't go wrong with it. So anyway, on to number two. Father. Hey! So here we are with the Avengers at second place. Who could, what could be the first place, you wonder? Well, if you've been keeping track of what movies I've talked about, then you already know. But since there's only one other Marvel movie left. But um, the Avengers, it's, it was, you know, it's a very special movie to me because it's the culmination of, it, or it was the culmination of four years of separate films all leading up to this. Arguably the most ambitious uh, film franchise to date when it comes to uh, continuity and building up these characters in their separate films and just finally leading up to this epic team-up um, to conclude Marvel Phase 1. It's, it's, it's great. I think that, you know, again, like I said, with Guardians of the Galaxy, it was, I had an incredibly difficult time deciding which one of these was better than the other which i don't really think that either of them are better than each other per se but i gave avengers the number two spot because i had more emotional investment in the characters because they had been built up with their own separate films so um that's the, really the reason that the avengers is number two on this list and, you know, it's just, it was great. It's It was a great spectacle, you know. It's seeing all these characters interact with each other that you had you had known, you know, for years in their own movies. You know, it's like, you know, for years you'd been hypothesizing, like, oh, I wonder what uh, Iron Man's going to say to Captain America when they meet. Or I wonder uh, if, you know, he and Thor are going to get along and stuff. And you got to see it all play out on the big screen. It's pretty much everything that I wanted from... The Avengers um, is what we got. We got, you know, great team interactions, great action, and it's it was, it's a it's great. <laughs> what more can I say about it? You know, it's it's a really fun time. But I do think that if you go into this movie not seeing any other Marvel movies previous to that, then you're going to be kind of at a loss because. I think that you de it definitely relies on those other Marvel films to introduce you to the characters and get you to care about the characters. Um, and then the Avengers is kind of like... I really, I like to think of it as just like one big movie where the previous Marvel films, that was the beginning, you know, rising action, you know, especially... And then this is the, the climax of the Marvel Phase 1. You know, if... This is the big finale of the Mar if Marvel Phase 1 was a movie. And so here we are at number one. 
What could it be? Well, there's really no surprise, because this is the only Marvel movie left that has been made. So, uh, yeah. What is it? It's Captain America the Winter Soldier. Now, I just want to say that a lot of times I have this nasty habit of setting unrealistically high expectations for movies, especially when they're franchises and licenses and brands that I personally love. And oftentimes when this happens, you know, I'm just like, oh man, this movie's going to be great. And, you know, I hope it's going to be great. And then I go see the movie and usually it's not. It usually, you know, it underperforms to my expectations, sometimes only slightly, and sometimes quite, quite underperforms, uh, such as the instance with Iron Man 3, but that's, eh, that's neither here nor there. But, with Captain America the Winter Soldier, I, you know, same thing as always, set these high expectations, which I know I shouldn't, and... It was actually better than what I expected it to be. It was phenomenal. And this is one of those films that I can honestly... If somebody is totally not a superhero fan, they don't really care for comic books and comic book movies, I can, I can still recommend this movie to them. As was the case, um, actually only a few weeks ago, I was in Illinois visiting some family there, and I went to see it at this, I went, there's a second run movie theater, which if you're not familiar with, these are these like movie theater chains that pick up these movies like after they've had their main run at the big like cine, cinema plexes, um, these theaters like they pick it up again and they pick up what, whenever it's finished there and they show it. And so I, I saw, went and saw Captain America again for like the third time in theaters with, um, my grandparents, who, you know, you know, their grandparents, you know, they don't really care about, you know, comic books and Star Wars and stuff like that. They're more into westerns and <laughs> and other things, you know, Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart and those those movies, which, you know, are great as well, but in a different way. And they really enjoyed Captain America as, you know, and, and they don't even really like comic book movies. I mean, it's just... It's a great action movie. It's a great adventure movie. It's got um, lots of espionage in it. And, you know, it's just, it's a great spy adventure movie. And really, you know, if it weren't for the title of the movie, you could you can honestly forget that it's it's a Captain America movie. Because, I mean, really, he does, for the majority of the movie, he's not even in his uniform. He's just, you know, plain clothes or he's wearing his, his stealth uniform. And... It's just, it's terrific, honestly. I think it has one of the best uh, villains in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, this side of Loki. That being, um, and this is spoilers for Captain America, so if you haven't seen it, then you might want to end the video here. But it has one of the greatest villains, I think, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, that being not so much the Winter Soldier, because Winter Soldier, uh, he doesn't really get to do a whole lot in this movie. I think that his moment to shine will definitely be in Captain America 3, which they've already announced for 2016. Um, so, but I think that uh, Alexander Pierce in this movie, played by Robert Redford, I thought he was really great. And I think that the um, that Robert Redford really brought um, a certain seriousness and levity to, or not levity, but a, a certain seri seriousness and uh, gravity to the movie. Um, because, you know, he's such a well-known and established, you know, serious Hollywood actor. And here he is in a Marvel movie. And I just think it, it you know, it, it, it you know, it kind of legitimatizes. I like, legitimate, I don't even think that's a word. But it, it uh, you know, it, it just makes it seem more, you know, cool, I guess. And, I mean, he's great. Um... As the villain, you know, and honestly, I didn't see the whole Hydra plot twist coming. The whole shield is Hydra thing. You know, when I saw that for the first time, my mind was just like, oh. I did not expect that, honestly. I mean, I knew that Hydra wouldn't be finished after Captain America 1. But I did not expect them to come back like that with, you know... Shield is Hydra. It's it was it was insane, and 
I was a bit disappointed, though, that they did the whole fake-out death with Nick Fury. Um, because it seems like that's kind of a problem with the Marvel movies, is that they they can't really kill off any characters. I mean, I can't really think of, um, besides, like, maybe, like, some minor characters on the side, like, uh... Well, first off, the villain usually dies, but that's with every comic book movie since, um... Really, I think, like, Batman 89 was, like, the first big one, I think, to kill off the villain. But, um, yeah, so the com the villain always gets killed off more, of more often than not. But, um, in terms of, like, hero characters, only, like, minor side characters get killed. Like, I think, really, the only one that pops up to mind is, um, Frigga from Thor 2. Um, and I... And... Probably, yeah, Jensen from the first Iron Man. But they were, like, very minor characters in the grand scheme of things. So these big characters, you know, at to this point, they're, they've they been untouchable. Even, like, when a movie is, like, advertising, like, oh, this hero is going to be, you know, humi humiliated and, and, you know, and brought down to our level, I suppose. Like, I think, like, Iron Man 3... Why, why is it that I keep on bringing up Iron Man 3? I guess it's just because it's so disappointing that I can use that as examples of what not to do in a superhero film. But, you know, like, their whole marketing campaign was like, you know, oh, the bad guy's taking the fight to Tony, and then they constantly use the Malibu mansion exploding as their advertising gimmick. And, you know, it was... You know, it's just, nothing ever happens. No hero actually dies in these movies, but... So, I thought it would have been cool if Nick Fury actually stayed dead, and that would open the gate for Maria Hill, you know, taking charge as the head of whatever would be left of S.H.I.E.L.D., even though S.H.I.E.L.D. is pretty much disassembled now. Maybe it'll come back as Hammer. But anyway, so, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, it's a fantastic film. My favorite Marvel film, and... Definitely um, one of my favorite superhero films in general. Great spy thriller, and it's recommendable to pretty much everybody who enjoys a good time at the movie theaters, even if you have n never seen a Marvel film previous to this, because I think what you need to know from the first Captain America film, it sums that up nicely. So it, it's, it's, it works good as a standalone film, even though I think you will benefit if you see the other Marvel films, but... Anyway, so it's it's a good time for anybody, even if you don't care for superhero films. So that's been my uh, my top ten Marvel films list. Hopefully you've been sticking it with me this entire time. I don't know how long this video is going to end up being after I edit it, but I appreciate you guys for watching as always. So let me know in the comments below what your top ten or top whatever Marvel films would be. And um, yeah, so that's it. So thank you guys for watching as always. This is Joker Fett signing out.